All right, everybody, my goal is at one after, I'm always going to go ahead and get started. So welcome to Grand Rounds, another beautiful October morning. I think the colors are almost at peak, so enjoy the weekend coming up. So today, I am very honored to introduce our Grand Rounds speaker. Uh, this is Dr. Paul Matthews. He is the Edmund and Lily Safara Chair and he is the Division Chief of Brain Sciences and the Associate Director of the UK Dementia Research Institute in the Imperial College of London. He did his Phil D at the Department of Biochemistry at Oxford University, and this morning when I was getting up uh, early and reading through everything, I found out, and Dr. Michael Lucy, who uh, is also from uh, Europe told me, so Phil D is a PhD that's obtained specifically at Oxford University. His MD is from Stanford University Medical School. He did his internship at Stanford University, followed by his residency in neurology and chief residency year at the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. He is highly honored. I've just chose a few things from his CV. He is in the Fellowship of Academia Europa, the Fellowship of the Academy of Medical Sciences, and he is an honorary officer of the Order of the British Empire, awarded by HM Queen Elizabeth II for services to neurosciences. He is a highly productive person, and his CV is incredibly impressive. He has uh, mentored over 41 doctoral students in his career up to this time. Just in 2018, I was asking him if he's actually ever home, because he's had uh, over 14 and now 15 uh, international talks just in 2018 alone. He's had over 375 peer-reviewed papers, co-authored five books, over 50 book chapters, letters, and reviews. And in looking at his uh, research enterprise, right now he is PI uh, on eight active grants, uh, and that is just the main PI status. So he's, he's very well renowned in his area. So, and I know I walked over here with a neurologist who was coming over to see Grand Rounds, so thank you to everyone who's from uh, other departments. So today the talk is going to be how can we see disease before it happens, invigorating epidemiology with modern techniques. Dr. Sanji Asana was helpful in bringing our Grand Round speaker here. So uh, Dr. Matthews, please come forward. Thank you, Dr. Well, thank you, Dr. Trowbridge. Gosh, I wish my mother was here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, first, I, I just want to say how, um, how genuinely nice it is to be here. Uh, it is true that I, I travel many places, but I, I have a, a special affection for Wisconsin. I, I had a grandmother and grandfather who, who lived uh, in the far north of this state, and I remember what it's like in winter. So I'm impressed that all of you have survived. Uh, <laughs> But uh, no, it's great to be here, and I want to thank uh, Sanjay as my host for uh, setting up a really a terrific set of meetings yesterday uh, where I met uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a broad group of exciting investigators. And I'm, I'm certainly walking away from the University of Wisconsin with a real sense of the incredible vibrancy of the science uh, here. So I hope that... Um, I can uh, entertain you with uh, uh, some of uh, the observations um, that I've made over the last few years with regard to large-scale epidemiological studies uh, for late-life disorders. I should uh, give my, uh, uh, make it clear, however, that I'm, I'm a neurologist. Um, I've been interested in uh, uh, imaging and in molecular neuroscience. I'm not an epidemiologist, and so I've come to it over the last few years um, and learned a tremendous amount about what we can do. And this talk is really focused on how we can merge these different worlds of molecular neuroscience and imaging with epidemiology to make, um, uh, to make a set of tools for discovery that I think are going to be uh, very important as we move forward in the future, and that I know you too are uh, thinking about. Well. Um, most of this talk will focus on large-scale population imaging. And the 
uh, addition of imaging and indeed other digital tools uh, to large-scale population studies has really started to transform these in many ways, but not least of which in our experience in the United Kingdom has been uh, the transformation in the extent to which the people uh, involved in the studies have felt engaged by what they're doing. If we bring people into research studies and we start to collect arcane pieces of information with obscure performance measures, it's very hard to explain to them and it's very hard for them to understand what it is that they're doing or why they're doing it. But bringing them in for imaging studies or to measure movement and uh, behavior over time is a completely different sort of thing. And I was very struck by James Gorman's um, uh, comments in the New York Times with regard not to our study but to the Human Connectome Project uh, here in the U.S. that he was excited to participate and he was actually very proud to show his brain in the New York Times. Um, uh, he was very excited to participate because he said, you know, I actually found that I was doing this because I was looking for a hint of my individuality. So seeing what we have, seeing our bodies, understanding how we move and how we think in some uh, very direct way is an incredibly important tool because of its salience and that also is beginning to fuel uh, research. Now the, the, the biggest program that I've been involved with for the last um, 11 or so years has been the UK Biobank. Uh, I'm, uh, Rory Collins uh, leads this program and has been doing so with remarkable success over the last 15 years or so. Uh, it, um, is an, it's really the grandfather of all of the large population studies um, and uh, was a, a predecessor and uh, inspiration in part for the million person study that I know that you too are involved with here in the US. It involved uh, 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 the recruitment of half a million people from uh, across the UK. They were selected, uh, everyone in the UK, with, which is a, a single-payer health system, uh, is registered with, um, almost everyone is registered with a, a general practitioner. And uh, these people were randomly uh, uh, pulled from the national general practitioner list with an attempt to um, obtain a distribution that was geographically um, uh, uh, well dispersed across the country. About 15% of those who were invited to participate uh, back in the early, in the first decade of this century um, agreed. And they, it really is uh, an, an extraordinary commitment by these people. And uh, it is sustained by their pride in being part of this cohort. They uh, uh, were first entered into um, uh, a, a period of extensive um, baseline phenotyping which involved coming to a bespoke center. All of the centers were set up um, uh, as on greenfield sites, um, small, uh, quick assembly uh, sorts of buildings with dedicated staff that did one thing, and that thing was UK Biobank. And it was, um, each of these are run like an assembly line. I'll come back to that point in a, in a moment. And that's what makes it phenomenally efficient. And uh, people would come to this and spend about four hours being processed, moving from one station to the next, having uh, questions asked, being poked and prodded, and having various sorts of body fluids taken. Um, and then they agreed to be followed up um, uh, uh, every five years with a repeat assessment. Um, they, there's a reconsent provision uh, within the uh, protocol, so they can be contacted periodically to participate in enhancements of the uh, data collection, which I'll, I'll describe a couple of those in a minute. Moreover, these incredibly selfless people have agreed to allow the, all of their electronic health records, um, which are extensive in the UK, covering hospital episode statistics, GP contacts, pharmacy um, uh, uh, use, and of course, cancer registry and, and death records. The um, <coughs> Uh, the most e extraordinary thing I haven't put on here, and that is that this database um, is uh, in an anonymized form uh, or pseudonymized form, is open to researchers all across the world. Uh, there is, um, uh, for the basic data, other than the time to uh, uh, process 
quality control and upload it. Uh, there is no embargo period. And so that means that you have as much right to access that database as I do uh, within the terms of the consent. It's, it's really extraordinary. And these people um, have done um, an amazing thing for science. Uh, or, uh, serially, uh, the Biobank team and researchers worldwide are contributing to enhancing uh, the, the database by such um, activities as adjudication of health outcomes by matching across uh, record systems, uh, linking ICD-9 and 10 codes to other sorts of outcome measures uh, to ensure their um, veracity. Um, uh, secondly, as investigators uh, derive um, additional uh, phenotypic information from, uh, from data, for example, by uh, analysis of the imaging data sets and deriving measures rather out, out of the images. Um, part of the agreement with anyone who has the data is that they um, uh, provide the outcomes back to Biobank and they're then posted on the websites to be available for everyone else. And so it's, a, it's really a community. It's growing into a community effort. Now, half a million people actually isn't very large. Um, and I'll, I'll say that not with tongue. I used to say it with tongue in cheek, but I've now come to really believe this. Uh, this is just a minimal data set because this, um, if you start thinking of nested case control studies for outcomes that are uh, uh, incident over the, um, the course of life of these people, uh, one is actually beginning to whittle down for any given disease at any given stage. Uh, with a strong control group, whittle this half a million down to uh, populations that can be actually relatively small, hundreds or just a few thousand. For example, there are only a few hundred people with multiple sclerosis in this, um, uh, in this half million uh, cohort, which you could have imagined from the size. Uh, but some of the major diseases of late life <coughs> are really rather well represented. And of course, the um, the extraordinary thing about being able to follow people longitudinally is as uh, they age, I remember these people entered from age 40, uh, in some cases as they age, a new disease will arise. And so the prevalence of disease in the population of late life diseases that are common uh, is rising rapidly over the next few years. And if we look at you know, my own area of interest, uh, right now the um, number of people with Alzheimer's disease um, is relatively low. Uh, it's about um, uh, uh, two-thirds of that at this point. Um, by uh, uh, 2025, which I still hope to be able to be around to enjoy, um, you know, we really will have a substantial population. And this is actually the major point, the first major point that I want to make. By studying these uh, midlife population cohorts, um, they do tend to be relatively healthy when they enter such prospective longitudinal studies. There's a selection bias in this, and collecting from the community as, from, as opposed to a hospital obviously selects for healthier people. But everyone develops the diseases of mid and late, late life at some point. And um, uh, what we are looking at now as we look at those people who don't have Alzheimer's at this point but will in 2020, 2025, is what the disease looks like to 10 uh, and uh, uh, 15 years before it ever appears. There is no other way that we're going to be able to study this disease in its earliest forms, time when we want to, uh, uh, to identify the pathology to reverse it, than uh, through these large population cohorts like this. Now, I'll give you a little bit of a flavor for the way Biobank is designed. So the core Biobank protocol was built around um, what I would call relatively standard epidemiology, um, uh, with the caveat um, that uh, there is an, a massive bank of biosamples that's maintained at the UK Biobank headquarters that's being progressively analyzed and released for analysis. Uh, as new funders step in to try to help out. Um, and over the course of, uh, it includes um, a variety of core measures of basic uh, cardiac and lung function. Um, uh, it includes, um, and, and then uh, the link to electronic health records, as I've said, 
uh, a variety of standard measures, but then progressively over the years, it's been enhanced by a range of things. I'll describe some physical activity monitoring uh, that came in some years ago. Uh, not shown on this was um, optical coherence tomography. Each of these enhancements is done typically on populations of around 100,000 at a time. So the, the ethos of Biobank is don't do anything unless you're going to do it at scale. Um, um, the, um, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the imaging um, uh, in a moment, uh, but I want to emphasize that one of the core issues in Biobank and one of the most popular, one of the, the elements that's made it most popular among researchers is an intensive focus on um, uh, genetically characterizing the population well. So all the populations uh, about two, all the population about two years ago uh, was uh, uh, genotyped and then um, uh, with the imputed um, uh, markers um, run to about 73 million now. And then there have been progressive adding uh, addition of uh, uh, on 125,000, this whole exome sequencing. And by the end of next year, the first uh, whole genome sequences uh, on uh, will be released and the full set uh, probably by 2021. It's an extraordinary uh, resource. Now let me just go into a little bit of detail about a couple of them to give you a flavor uh, for how these things are operationalized. Um, physical activity monitoring, of course, everyone's familiar with. Um, the issues, um, the problem for um, a large population study like this is one wants to have rigid standardization so that we are taking the same measurement in the same way roughly at the same period of time over everyone to remove many of the sources of variance um, associated with measurement. Now, to deploy uh, a device uh, to 100,000 people uh, is, um, is potentially challenging, and it took a lot of research. They arrived on uh, a small device. Um, it's actually now not, uh, you know, rather, uh, rather old-fashioned. This is now about five years ago, the Actigraphy AX3 device. Um, at that time, it was really quite in inexpensive. I'm afraid actigraphy has discovered how valuable their tool is, and it's um, increased about four times in cost since. But it was about 30 pounds per unit. Um, it's very robust. They added a, a fancy wristband and would uh, mail this device out to um, individuals in, uh, uh, in groups of a few thousand at a time. Um, these have uh, self-contained batteries, and the memory store is sufficient to um, uh, allow collection of data for about two weeks. People would wear it, then they'd put it in the post, come back to buy a bank, uh, the data would be downloaded, the device recharged, and it's sent out to a second group of people. Bizarrely enough, very few of these devices were lost. Um, and um, uh, uh, it, uh, over a period of about two years, all 100,000 pieces of data were collected. That data can be downloaded raw. It's a massive data set. Uh, the first reports uh, that have come out of the, M, uh, have come out of the MRC um, uh, nutrition unit in Cambridge that uh, uh, set up this, uh, uh, this, uh, sub -pro this enhancement have, um, have used a, a relatively simple approach to the analysis at this point. Um, but uh, this is really just to make a first pass at the data. Uh, the raw data is there to encourage people to explore it and um, uh, using, use a variety of methods, artificial intelligence, which I'll come back to in a moment, uh, being one of them, uh, to uh, provide richer information. What they did is they uh, basically made some rather simple uh, technical corrections to um, the data in the tool uh, to uh, uh, derive the vector of acceleration body specifically. Um, uh, they uh, downsampled this to make it um, uh, much more tractable for analysis, summarized it um, by uh, sparse, sparsifying it to five second intervals, and then they developed these uh, plots for individuals that over, for example, here, a period of a few days only, you can see actually activity patterns by uh, five second um, uh, increments uh, for whoever this individual is. Uh, this is this is a very simple measure. It doesn't say, tell anything about act, the specific type of activity or the direction. It's a mean acceleration measure. But it does begin to pull out some very interesting characteristics, which you can begin to see at the simplest level, just at the population 
uh, level. Here is mean acceleration by uh, hour of the day uh, from early in the morning when people, most people are asleep uh, to uh, later in the evening. And what you see here is the, in dark, the dark line expresses what the vigorous 45 to 54-year-olds, and I think all of you are vigorous. I should say vigorous 45 or 54-year-olds are those older who feel like they're 45 or 54. And you see all of that group is remarkably active in the early evening. Okay, but uh, as we age, and here's the um, older uh, group, 75 to 79, uh, on the tail. Um, they're, again, remarkably active in the morning, showing how, you know, how diurnal we are as a species. Uh, but again, the activity tails off with um, uh, the, the end of the day. And this is really important. Um, it emphasizes something that's known to all of the women in the audience, that women are slightly more active, for sure, than men are, uh, particularly in the morning. Um, but uh, I'm being facetious, but, but of course you can begin to dive into this and really look at the, um, at the interaction of this with a whole range of factors like comorbid disease, um, uh, nutrition, uh, where, you, where people live, uh, there's, you know, uh, and so on, uh, to derive very rich data, rich information indeed. Now most of what I'm going to talk about today will focus on the uh, imaging enhancement. And um, uh, this is something that uh, took some years in planning, uh, but uh, we initiated as a pilot in 2014 over a period of about uh, seven months uh, to show that it was feasible. It really was, um, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you when, when Rory Collins first came to me in 2006, seven and asked whether we could do something like this. He wasn't quite sure what it would look like. I was um, utterly unbelieving. You know, I thought maybe one could get a very simple imaging protocol in, uh, but the idea of doing something sophisticated on uh, 100,000 people seemed to me to be uh, um, uh, science fiction. But what we're conducting is um, 3T MRI scans of the brain, uh, a very standard, um, although uh, brisk set, um, 1.5 Tesla imaging of the heart, uh, without contrast, associated with um, uh, with movement of the table, with whole body imaging, including a, uh, a couple of special Dixon sequences for the liver. Uh, then people move to uh, yet another station where they have DEXA uh, of the whole body, uh, and then another where um, they're given a 3D carotid ultrasound. Um, I just want to describe a couple of things about this because I was uh, one of the things I've learned from Biobank is is what happens when you bring things to scale and turn it into a well-considered process. It becomes remarkably efficient. Uh, people, participants come into the door, they're pre-screened for, um, uh, uh, for contraindications to participation uh, in the imaging scan. Uh, after being checked in, uh, they change into gowns um, in uh, the imaging suites. Um, they go into a period, into an area where they have online cognitive testing while they're still fresh and coming into the, um, uh, into the center. Uh, they have, uh, there's a number of other data that's taken and a blood sample. And then they uh, move um, into a well-organized, literally computer-controlled partitioning uh, between the different stations. Uh, first, one being for the brain MRI, second being for the chest and cardiac M uh, and, and body MRI, and the third being for the DEX and carotid ultrasound. And they move through these. Each of them has been timed precisely. The amount of time at each station is identical so that people can weave in uh, in between the two of them without queuing, having to queue up before each of them, and then they're processed and can leave. About a remarkable 95% of people have after going through this have expressed a willingness to return. Uh, it takes about three and a half hours, uh, but they seem to feel that they're very well informed about the process and uh, uh, can move, move out. Now, there are a lot of is interesting issues about, the, uh, the, the, about ethical issues associated with, for example, acquiring uh, such images. I'm happy to answer questions later. I won't discuss them right now. I just wanted to give you a flavor for what kinds of things one can begin to explore in these data. And um, as it has started to become really available only since um, uh, about September of 2016, we're at the very earliest stages of beginning to exploit it as a community. 
But here is just a, uh, this is from a paper a number of us um, put together as more as a methods description um, uh, uh, in uh, uh, late 2016. This um, uh, describes, this can give you a flavor for a couple of things about um, uh, the brain imaging. Uh, the first is I, I just want to emphasize how remarkably homogeneous this, this um, set of brain images is. It, the, it is. the data, the harmonization, because each of the scans, there are four centers, but each of the scanners is identical. The protocols are absolutely identical. Uh, and moreover, there is uh, obsessive concern for uh, the ways in which people are placed in the scanners, uh, how the data is handled, so that it is very, very comparable. There's no data set like it, I'm, I'm very confident. This is a brain image that um, you'll recognize, just a T1-weighted brain image, but it has one very uh, important uh, curiosity. You can see it's a little bit fuzzy. Now, rather than being unimpressed, let me tell you the reason it's a little bit fuzzy is <coughs> because that's actually an image of 5,000 people. So what's, what's been done, just to show you how homogeneous the, how this data is, is those 5,000 have been co-registered um, you know, from tall people, short people, women, men, etc. They've been co-registered. You can see the matching is quite remarkable. And uh, so that means that you have a common brain space in which you can really interrogate um, uh, relationships between brain structural features at a very fine level and um, other uh, aspects of the individual. And this gives you something of a, of a sense of this. Here, this is looking, uh, this is a mass, I'll show you a couple of these through the talk. This is a very crude approach to just getting an idea of what might be in the data. This is a mass univariate uh, correlation. This, this, on the abscissa here, there are 11,000 different uh, phenot uh, phenotypic, independent phenotypic measures that are obtained um, uh, related to things like uh, uh, their reported early life um, exposures, um, uh, aspects of their lifestyle, uh, work, uh, nutrition, um, uh, alcohol consumption, uh, physical activity, um, uh, and then uh, some cognitive uh, measures that are taken with the uh, online testing and so on. So there are 11,000 of these variables that are collected on each person. And if one just takes uh, uh, tests for uh, relationships uh, between uh, brain, structural, uh, uh, brain structural variants and uh, these 11,000. You see that um, this is the um, uh, Bonferroni correction line, very simple correction uh, just um, for these 11,000 variables and for all pixel volumes within the brain. So it's a massive Bonferroni correction. But despite that, you can see that a very, very broad range of features, obviously, particularly including physical features. We know that tall people, large people have bigger brains than small people do. So that's not surprising. Uh, but it just shows how incredibly rich this is and helps us get a guide to where to dive in uh, to do more careful analyses. Now, one of the, um, this is also beginning to teach us about where variance lies in the brain. So there's a lot of variance that we've known for a long time in the way the brain folds and the um, the uh, thickness of the cortex. Um, uh, but in fact, it turns out that the white matter of the brain uh, is a source of very rich uh, variants um, in the population and probably extremely relevant both to understanding differences in cognitive phenotypes uh, as well as disease. And this, um, the, uh, we've used a, um, uh, a rather elegant uh, multi-band um, um, uh, uh, double shell diffusion tensor approach from which one can pull out all the variables associated for those of you who understand uh, the methods with a technique called NADI. Um, but this allows one to not only look at fractional anisotropy, which all of you are familiar with uh, from radiology clinically um, and mean diff diffusivity, um, but also pull out measures of intracellular and extracellular water content. Um, so that one can look at uh, finer structure in the way, for example, axons are packed in the white matter. And these are rather beautiful uh, representations of them. But again, one sees a really remarkable uh, degree of um, 
um, a significant correlation with uh, many phenotypic features, and we found it extremely sensitive to early disease in many, uh, many ways. Now, just looking at this sort of data in a different way, I can uh, begin to uh, describe in a little bit more detail how rich the brain imaging uh, data set is. Um, uh, 3D uh, T1 images are acquired, susceptibility weighted uh, brain images are acquired to look at iron deposition, um, uh, the diffusion I've described, uh, and then in addition there are two tasks um, there are two fMRI protocols embedded, uh, one related to the Harari face matching task to look for emotional salience, uh, the other uh, a resting state um, analysis. And what one can see is these all show uh, different extents of association with these, uh, with um, uh, the 11,000 independent phenotypic variables. Here each of them is colored in a different different way, but you can see that you derive um, different sorts of information from these complementary imaging techniques. Now, I'm sorry for the, the rapid run through, there's, there's just an enormous amount of interest in the depth of this, but I'll just you know, begin to give you some sense of one uh, kind of um, uh, information that I think you'll, you'll all understand uh, very well. From the T2 uh, weighted image data sets, uh, one can uh, derive measures of uh, white matter hyperintensities. Um, uh, there are uh, an increasing number of um, increasingly uh, precise um, uh, measures of uh, ways of uh, assessing the volume and nature of these white matter hyperintensities automatically, from which using one, in this case a technique called Bianca, uh, it was possible in the first um, 8,000 or so images uh, to begin to look at simple associations of these white matter hyperintensities with a variety of factors. Now, again, I'm skirting over all sorts of interesting things, like, for example, their prevalence in diabetes as opposed to non-diabetics, um, uh, their association with cardiovascular um, and risk factors and so on. But if you simply look at age, what you begin to see is a pattern that we, we find in biobank consistently across data sets. Uh, there's a regression um, uh, with uh, major factors like aging uh, through life, uh, but the, the real interest lies in then diving deep uh, to explore what, um, what is responsible for this broad variance that you see. What's really important is not that you get more white, white matter hyperintensities with aging, but that some people get a lot more and some people don't seem to get very many at all. And that's what these large data sets start to be able to allow you to do. We've um, uh, taken a little bit of a deep dive into hypertension and prehypertension to go back to an issue that um, uh, you know, we've been interested in for some time, and that is the extent to which um, the mechanisms by which uh, chronic hypertension uh, may predispose uh, people to late life cognitive dysfunction. And it's become clear from these studies that if one looks at the, uh, certainly at the uh, neuroanatomical correlates, just as clinical studies have begun to show us in the last couple of years, uh, there's no clear cutoff of risk. Uh, there's a continued gradation of change in the brain with increased systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Uh, there, um, uh, there's no magic threshold of um, more effect versus lower, less effect. And these eff and, and hypertension here uh, affects some of the, uh, the most important uh, broad, um, uh, the most important broad um, uh, projection fibers in the brain. Let's see. Yeah, I've lost something, Clint. So they uh, affect some of the most important of the broad projection fibers in the brain, for example, uh, the thalamic radiations, which for, the, for neurologists um, says a, a very great deal because the thalamus actually, not the heart, is the seat of the soul. Now what we can begin to do also with these data sets is because there's a lot of comorbid disease, a lot of risk factors represented, and we have one consistent data set, we can do a very simple thing, but I think it's an important thing for helping us understand how to prioritize our efforts moving forward. It really has been quite difficult to do before, and that is we can look at multiple risk factors and look at their relative impact on brain structural changes in late life. And not surprising uh, 
to, uh, to anyone is that the, uh, I, I won't go through these representations um, uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very deeply, uh, but here if we look at the, uh, the total change that we see with age, that complete reg the complete regression, as it were, in the kind of plot that I showed you before, that's the whole pie. And age-specific effects, those effects that we, we seem to be able to dissociate from identified comorbid diseases, account for a large proportion of that. So there is something, I'm afraid, about aging that makes our, our brain um, uh, change its, uh, its size over time. Uh, but these, uh, these common comorbidities, even in a, in a relatively healthy population, account for about... Uh, 10 to 15 percent of that variance over time. That's the variance that we're seeing above and below the line. And we can begin to dive into that variance and look at what accounts for uh, the greatest proportion of it. And I think uh, what's really interesting is hypertension does play a, a big role, or at least sustained systolic blood pressure. Um, obesity uh, plays a significant independent role that we still don't understand very well. Uh, and, um, and of course, uh, diabetes uh, or metabolic uh, diabetes uh, that is uh, clinically expressed independent of uh, simply metabolic disease does this as well. Now, having the genetics allows us to look at um, genotype uh, structural uh, correlations. Um, there's a, a lovely paper that um, uh, Lloyd Elliott, uh, in conjunction with Jonathan Marchi uh, Marchini and Steve Smith, who's worked with me on the project for many years, um, have uh, published in Nature just about three weeks ago, which looks into, which, which gives some, uh, you know, an overview of what kinds of things you can do with this genetics. But this is one that really has interested me. Uh, so, um, if one looks across the brain using T2 star susceptibility weighted imaging, which gives us a measure of iron deposition in the brain, areas of increased iron content, as you all know, that tends to increase with age. Um, and even aside from microbleeds, uh, there in, in many people we see increased deposition, particularly in the deep gray matter. Uh, here is a segmentation of, uh, at a population level of where the iron tends to be most, which uh, you can see is lying in the basal ganglia. Now, if one looks at the, uh, there's a lot of variance in the population regarding the extent of deposition of this iron. If one does a, um, a, a, a genome-wide association study with this variance, uh, one, you know, it's been, uh, on only the first uh, 9,000 subjects or so, it's proved remarkably positive. Um, I won't go into, this is described in the Nature paper, I won't go into all of these, but they're, they're all associated with iron, um, met iron management, uh, iron metabolism, uh, mineral, uh, uh, mineral uh, transport and uptake, um, and, um, and uh, maintenance of the, uh, of the cell. Uh, one of the most interesting of these genes, and sorry, and what you can do is take each of these individual SNPs and actually map its relationship spatially uh, to the iron deposition. Uh, again, further confirming that we're all taught that this is measuring something that we're talking about. Now, uh, what you may not be so aware of is that there's been there's long been an interest in iron deposition as a mechanism of late life neurodegeneration, um, uh, and this has been this was uh, inspired by. Uh, the finding that people with um, uh, multifocal uh, uh, microbleeds uh, tended to um, uh, become more cognitively impaired than those without. Now, the hypothesis in general was that they were just having more microbleeds. But the alternative hypothesis um, uh, has begun to be of interest that it's not that they're having more iron more microbleeds, it's simply that they're less able to clear the iron once a microbleed has occurred. And so what the microbleeds that we see on imaging are, are a marker for a more general problem with iron handling. And there really was, there was a very lovely study, in population level study in India that I won't have time to go into that provides further uh, evidence for this. Well, one of the genes that has been identified here that is of particular interest is the, hemo is the familial hemochromatosis uh, associated uh, SNP. Now, familial hem hemochromatosis um, is a disease that many of you will know far more about than I do. But uh, 
the, um, when the most common mutation is, um, uh, is put in a, mal uh, a mouse, uh, just like the patients, there's a prominent neurodegenerative phenotype. So here's the wild type mouse with an MR image in coronal section. You see the ventricles here. Here's uh, the mouse carrying um, the uh, hemochromatosis associated uh, human mutant gene um, here. And you see uh, at the similar age, um, there is a marked uh, neurodegenerative phenotype. Um, here, this is expressed graphically with the difference between the mutant, uh, the lateral ventricle size, and the mutant versus the healthy controls. Now, it turns out what actually happens is the, the, the biochemistry of this is really fascinating. This is HMG-CoA uh, uh, reductase. Um, the, uh, there's an indirect effect on expression of this and um, a broad disturbance of cholesterol metabolism critical to maintaining um, uh, both neurons and particularly oligodendroglial cells and, and myelin in the brain. And so the working hypothesis now is that um, this uh, gene mutation, which now has been you know, very clearly associated with common iron deposition, not just the rare syndrome of familial hemochromatosis, is itself a marker uh, associated with secondary biochemical changes that affect cholesterol metabolism. So what we're seeing as iron deposition is really reflecting a much more, a much broader uh, metabolic defect associated with neurodegeneration. Now I'm going to move a little bit uh, toward, very much towards the end now, but I just want to highlight couple more things. Of course, there's a great deal of rich information, and, some, and there, there are approaches that can be used that don't demand, don't necessarily demand um, uh, at the first instance the deep dive into the fundamental mechanisms, but one can derive a great deal simply from the images themselves as a radiologist normally would in the clinic. Here again, uh, this is um, from uh, one of our postdocs, James Cole. Uh, done on a uh, in a slightly different way than what I've just described, uh, using uh, smaller data sets meta-aggregated. Uh, but here one is looking at that same sort of age regression that I showed before. Uh, what he then did is um, uh, this was the training population. He went into an independent population, a really extraordinary population, the Lothian birth cohort. Everyone born on the same day in the 1930s has been followed through life. So they're all of exactly the same age. But if you look at um, uh, uh, the structure of their brain using a machine learning tool that's trained on the healthy, on, on the normal population brain age, so that you can look at the brain and say, well, that brain is likely to be about 60 years old. If you look at that Lothian birth cohort population, which at the time the scans were conducted were in their early 70s, again, there were some who looked from their brain much younger than they were chronologically and some uh, who showed the reverse. Uh, we've now, they've now been followed long enough that you can look at um, mortality. And uh, the group who are down here um, actually uh, have, um, this arrow is in the wrong place, but have um, uh, really have had a quite good survival. The group that are up here who have a brain age that is in excess of their chronological age um, uh, were dying uh, at much higher frequency within the five-year follow-up. Now, within Biobank, uh, there are improved methodologies being developed now based on neural networks uh, that can uh, really subsample the whole Biobank cohort and create models of the truly healthy, super healthy population in this age uh, to begin to explore this more uh, deeply. Now, I didn't want to leave those of you who are interested in things below the neck completely out, and so I'm going to take a very brief pass uh, and show you the cardiac imaging is, uh, is relatively sparse. They're relatively thick sections for time reasons, but nonetheless, um, one can get uh, a, a pretty good uh, impression that I think all of you uh, will appreciate um, uh, for uh, the way the heart is functioning in the body. And what's extraordinary, of course, is this is currently available on about 28,000 and, of course, soon on many more. Now, the, pro the real challenge for this kind of imaging, with all of you will appreciate, is that the methodology for uh, segmenting, for understanding shape and size in a quantitative sense, critical for this kind of epidemiology, hasn't been very well developed for the heart 
as it has for the brain. And so this data set is actually spurring all sorts of new discovery. So my young colleague, Wenjie Abai, has um, uh, been one of those working on this problem. Uh, here's uh, just a, a pictorial representation of the kind of um, uh, the kind of approach that he's taken with um, uh, convolutional neural networks to go from those images, like I, as I've just shown you, uh, to actually s uh, identify, recognize automatically where the heart is, segment out the different structures from which one can get uh, really quite a rich uh, description uh, at a uh, uh, single, uh, uh, single chamber level um, uh, and do this. Uh, the remarkable thing is, and I find this absolutely mind-boggling, this segmentation process using the AI techniques takes about four seconds uh, per image. Uh, and you can contrast that with about uh, uh, an hour and a half of a very tired uh, residence time. Now, using this sort of, um, uh, this sort of data, one can uh, begin to acquire, uh, look at the data at a, at a really large population level, the same kinds of um, uh, broad regression curves that I've described before. Uh, are present here, for example, looking at end diastolic volume in the left ventricle as a function of age. You can see it declines uh, somewhat with age, as all of you know. Uh, but what I really want to emphasize here is if you look at this, these contour plots, um, this, of course, none of these are normal distributions. This is just saying something a little bit more precisely than I did before. Uh, these, uh, the median here, uh, the, the um, most common um, the measure here is really quite different from the mean, and it's in this variance, in these contour plots, that the disease information lies. And this is what's pulled out here. This is now looking at cardiac data. Uh, this is very simple, looking at the ventricular and uh, the four chamber volumes uh, as a function of, uh, uh, of these 11,000 phenotypes, as I've described before. And not surprising to you, here's the Bonferroni correction line. This, uh, the heart is a remarkably uh, good, uh, is a remarkably sensitive uh, to all of the things that we do in life. It almost makes one uh, want to go see a cardiologist. Uh, now, if we go into this and, and look, uh, uh, look into this with uh, uh, a little bit more depth, uh, amongst, for example, the uh, lifestyle food and drink associations in that 11,000, where those data came from, for example, uh, were questionnaires regarding for example, oily fish uh, intake. Um, uh, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about alcohol in a second. But it's the deep dive into this uh, regression map that makes uh, it really interesting. Now, here is a cautionary tale for all of us, uh, well, at least for some of us. Um, and um, uh, I still haven't, uh, I, I still manage to uh, ignore, you know, to somehow not process this data. But we've been working, we've been working very hard on um, uh, the effects of alcohol. And um, here are the effects of variance in alcohol consumption across the population. This was an uh, exposure measure uh, based on a number of questions that were asked to people. Uh, these are the regions pretty much everywhere in the left ventricle that are affected by alcohol in this population, looking at the highest quartile versus the lowest quartile. And here, is the, uh, here are the relative uh, p-values, so the, the most significant changes cluster around the base. We can do genetics on this. Um, the heart is proving a more difficult phenotype genetically. It seems to be much, have much greater, not surprisingly, much greater environment and lifestyle um, uh, effectors than, uh, uh, than the brain. Uh, but now that we're up to about 20,000, we're getting many more significant uh, factors. This is from the first 10,000. We're pulling out some, some very, we were pulling out some strong associations even then. Um, and, and really, what to, I don't have time to talk about this story, but what we're pulling out is uh, a number of um, genes, some of which are well precedented, like BAG3, uh, this, which is a, a known uh, cardiomyopathy associated uh, SNP. Um, and what it's really suggesting is that these, even in the normal population, not again, just as a common variant hypothesis would suggest, um, uh, common SNPs that give rise to uh, form first of, um, of larger phenotypes. Now, I won't 
go into the, um, the aortic data, which is very interesting. I just want to close on one other uh, of those very interesting things that everyone is interested in. So it's what lies beneath the skin. And um, this is uh, a map. Uh, these are maps of individual biobank participants looking at the distribution of their body fat. And the body fat is differentially colored, subcutaneous here, blue, uh, visceral, um, uh, red, uh, and uh, then in the musculature, different colors indeed. So you can see that uh, body habitus uh, hides all sorts of things. I'm always uh, intrigued by these uh, very thin people and I, um, who have, are carrying around a really substantial load of visceral body fat. And this is allowing us to begin to look at, um, I don't, uh, at the uh, genes that are controlling distribution of body fat and at their health risks. One of the most interesting areas of body fat is, of course, in the liver. Uh, there are some uh, extra imaging sequences uh, that are embedded that allow quantitative assessment of uh, hepatic fat uh, contribution. Here's the distribution across the population. Um, here are three exemplars of people with high, this is real hepatosteatosis here. Um, in fact, we discovered that about 25% of the otherwise healthy population in, uh, in the biobank uh, uh, cohort uh, had uh, imaging-based hepatosteatosis, really common. Not so. Now, finally, I just want to touch on this, that being able to understand something about the distribution of uh, liver, visceral, uh, subcutaneous, and other body fat um, allows one to develop a sort of map. And it turns out, uh, again, this is a much longer story that is, uh, uh, I'd, I'd refer you to this nice paper in obesity um, uh, earlier this year, allows one to uh, to differentiate, for example, uh, patterns. If you look at each of these measures as an independent vector, you can develop star maps that tell you something about uh, disease risk patterns. Uh, and here are two extreme examples, uh, the obese um, with um, uh, 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 high risk of uh, type 2 diabetes uh, versus low risk of diabetes. Um, and um, finally, I just want to um, bring this uh, to a close rather later than I had hoped, I'm afraid, I apologize, with, uh, to, to recognize this is an enormous project and I, I want to emphasize that I'm just a tiny part of a really massive project. It's been a, it's been a privilege to be part of it and to lead um, uh, in, in at least a small section. Lots and lots of people have contributed to it and I want to recognize particularly Rory whose uh, leadership has been critical, and the many, many people on the biobank team who helped to generate uh, the data that you're seeing today. Thank you. Uh, fascinating, amazing biobank. Dr. Matthew. So that's, um, uh, that's beginning to be explored. There, there certainly were, they're, they're really quite large, um, well, they're, they're easy to identify uh, differences with level of education. Uh, there are differences related to socioeconomic status uh, with um, uh, employment, uh, the nature of employment. Um, um, I, I think these are, these are really difficult questions to uh, to begin to unpick. Of course, with epidemiology, we're looking at associations all of the time. You know, uh, teasing out causal connections is, um, is fraught with challenges. Um, uh, but certainly the da these data behave uh, consistent with that hypothesis generally. Uh, one of the things I want to highlight, though, uh, for those of you who are non-neurologists, is never forget that the 
uh, the cortex, which contributes to much, you know, about half of the brain volume. We think of it as being packed with neurons. In fact, the cortex is packed with neurons and glia. And in fact, neurons are not the most abundant cell type. And uh, many of the, ch the increases in volume that one sees in uh, cortex from one individual to the next are accounted for by glia. And oddly enough, um, the famous story about Einstein's very uh, enlarged uh, uh, lateral parietal cortical folds um, turned out to be related to uh, Einstein had the greatest glial cells. Um, so. Thank you. Another question, and then repeat when you when you yeah. ask. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so the, the question, I think, and tell me if I've got this wrong, was um, um, so half a million people is, is fine, but there are 60 million people in the country. And how does one uh, make inferences about the 60 million when you start with only half a million? And then the second part of the question was how does one extend the phenotyping to, through linkages to um, uh, other devices and uh, so on that we use as part of our usual daily life. Is that right? So um, these population studies uh, are always, um, are, are never uh, fully, um, uh, they, they don't sample a population in an unbiased way. This is a highly biased sample. Uh, what we're trying to learn, what, however, it is potentially a representative sample. It includes um, members of most of the segments of the population, including minorities, um, although more, it's more limited. What one is uh, attempting to do with these studies is understand general principles that then can be used as hypotheses that are, that are carried out either in interventional studies or uh, in other population studies. Uh, the value of this is the harmonization of the data sets and the uh, degree of care in quality control. The limitation is obviously uh, the magnitude. Um, other sorts of studies are trying to do this, for example, by directly assessing the, uh, the uh, clinical databases themselves. A an approach that actually provides the data linkages to our common tools has not been tried yet to my knowledge. There are um, some emerging kinds of specific solutions. Data control in privacy related data control in Europe is, is rather tighter than it is in this country, so there are some barriers to it. And I think then the, the final uh, question, uh, well, so, so I think that probably covers both of the elements, but good but, questions. Uh, one last question. Yeah, so that was, um, uh, that was a major uh, question, and we took the issue very seriously. The, um, the, the current approach is, um, that, uh, that is developed is that um, uh, the, all of the subjects agree that, um, consistent with everything else in Biobank, that, unle that unless something is immediately noticed during the period of the examination, you know, for example, the radiographer sees a tumor when a scout image is being conducted. Not, the patient will not be told of any pathology that might be discovered at a later point. Uh, there is no formal radiological read of every image. However, uh, if the, uh, we then have the, and, and, and part of the reason for that is the fundamental impracticality. The other was that um, uh, we did a prospective study of the first 1,000 uh, subjects. We had paired uh, radiologist reads of every scan, and uh, we combined that with uh, 
uh, the current practice, which is if the radiographer notices something, it's flagged, then it goes to a radiologist and is formally read, and then uh, if there is patho potentially clinically relevant pathology, the participant and their GP are notified. Now, what we discovered in that are a couple of things. Um, first of all, of course, radiologists see more than the radiographer does uh, incidentally on the screen. They see about four times as much potentially relevant clinical pathology. However, um, if one, what happens, you know, you think about what happens when you find a lump or bump, particularly in the belly, uh, what do you do? You have to refer to someone who then has to do another set of images because MR isn't a particularly good modality for that. Uh, some people end up with invasive procedures. And in fact, um, a, only a very, very tiny percent of the total number of uh, potential abnormalities that were uh, ever turned out to be real abn clinical abnormalities. Most of them were just incidental findings. And that meant that people went through relatively long, expensive, anxiety-provoking um, uh, periods um, uh, for diagnosis. The balance of um, it was decided with public consultation and the Ethics and Governance Council that the balance of benefit and risk uh, was highest by having the radiographer uh, flag, um, even if they were missing some of the pathology, they were catching most of the major pathology. And um, uh, that, uh, and uh, again, it was we also satisfied ourselves that patient, that the participants were understanding the significance of that and accepting it. Thank you very much.